All right, everybody. Hello and welcome to another fantastic of RFRX. Today is Monday, April 12th, and I am so glad to see all of you here. There are so many people who have filled in and just joined us right off the bat. This is great. Um, I want to introduce myself. I'm Eric Wells. I'm the support group director for Recovering from Religion. And with me as my co-host today is Medlin Lodasco. And she is the uh, co-host and um, she also works on the helpline and uh, has you've seen her as a social host for many times. Uh, Medlin, what's been going on? How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. This is uh, my last RFRX for a little bit, so I'm a little sad but excited to be here. I know I had taken a couple of weeks, but I'm very excited to be here and get started. Wonderful. Well, um, tell us about the poll, Madeline. We've got a poll at the beginning of each one of these, right? Yes, we do. We have a poll that we're going to bring up and we'll also read it aloud for anyone that's not following along on the screen. The first one, is the alcoholic, Alcoholics Anonymous 12-step method backed by science? Yes, no, or I don't know. Is alcoholism a disease? Yes, no, or I don't know. And is abstinence the best approach to recovery? Also yes, no, or I don't know. We'll leave that up on the screen. Please feel free to answer. This is anonymous. We just like to get some metrics and get you familiarized with the topic that we'll be bringing up in the talk here shortly. Um, Eric, do you want to tell us about RFRI? Heck yeah, I do. Um, it's fantastic. So um, here, this is RFRX, and every week, every Monday night, we here in the U.S., um, it's actually Tuesday morning in some other places in the world, uh, we bring on some guests and, uh, and discuss topics that are relevant to folks who contact us through RFR, whether it's through the helpline or support groups or any other way. These topics are really imperative and important to those folks. Um, this isn't a replacement for our online community, which we'll talk to you a bit a little in a little bit, or it's uh, nor is it a um, replacement for the support groups. This is all complementary to that. Um, our experts here they provide some great advice and some good cop coping skills. Uh, we've got an email. If you have any topic suggestions that you haven't heard us talk about yet, you can email us at rfrx at recoveringfromreligion.org. And in addition to that this RFRx is being recorded. And so all of the RFRx is going back a full year are up on our YouTube channel for you to watch and enjoy and at your leisure. Okay, that's about RFRx. Let's tell you about RFR, recovering from religion. We hear us throw the initialism RFR around all the time. What the heck does it mean? It's recovering from religion. We offer hope, healing and support to those who are struggling with issues of doubt and non-belief. So how do we do that? How do we um, accomplish our myth mission? Um, first off, let's talk about healing. Medlin, you wanna take it away? Definitely. So we offer healing via the helpline. This is where people will listen to you with an empathetic ear. There's no judging, there's no criticism. It's 24 seven support via online chat or phone call. And there's also, there's so many resources that you can find, in particular, the resources section on the RFR website. It's a great place to get all kinds of links. You can watch videos on any kind of topic or subtopic uh, with an affiliation to all kinds of religions and leaving religion, et cetera. The hope comes in in the sharing and listening of personal stories. We do consider us all to be in this together. We have a blog and we have a podcast where you can read and also share different stories that we can find here in RFR. And we'll post these links here. Thank you, Eric. And I'll actually give it back to you for support. Yes, yes, this is my favorite part of RFR. I am not biased at all, though, being the support group director. The support groups, this is kind of where I feel the uh, rubber meets the road. This is where a lot of the long-term healing can take place. The support groups are face-to-face -face meetings. Um, they're all virtual right now. They used to be all in person, but uh, once we're through this COVID, we're going to do a mixture of both in-person and virtual. And um, 
this is where we all get to get together in a small, intimate, confined and uh, not confined, a small, intimate space that uh, privacy and confidentiality is um, incredibly valuable and valued in those spaces where we can talk about the issues, the doubts, the questions, the struggles that we go through that all stems back to some of our um, religious upbringing or background. Um, you can find the nearest support group to you at uh, the link in the description or at the chat. In addition to that, support can often, often be found by talking with a therapist. So we've talked a little bit about, uh, we've talked about the helpline and we've talked about the support group and those are both peer support. There's no really trained professional, licensed professional um, uh, that are provided for both of those. But we have those professionals available to you through the Secular Therapy Project. You can go to the STP website and get connected with a local therapist near you who, is been, who has been heavily vetted for, uh, to make sure they have the appropriate licensing in their state or country, to make sure that they're maintaining a secular practice so you won't run the risk of being proselytized to, and to make sure that they are using evidence-based treatments. Find the um, uh, you can create an account and um, find a secular therapist near you at uh, seculartherapy.org. Medlin, what's up next? The online community, which is my favorite part, we're going to talk about this online platform to meet people with similar backgrounds. There are Sunday night Zoom meetings and there's so many resources that you can find within the online community. We have that you can actually reach that via the website for recovering from religion. And we also want to give a shout out to the atheist community of Discord. They are a great place to also find additional resources. Thank you for sharing that, Eric. You bet. Um, right now, the ACD, the Atheist Community of Discord, they have got a special project running, and they asked if we could share a survey with uh, with you guys. So I put a link in the chat to that survey, and um, head on over to there and kind of give them your feedback. Sorry to interrupt you, um, Medellin. Uh, you want to tell us about volunteering? Yeah, for sure. So I'm a volunteer myself, and the first thing to say is that volunteering can also be a form of healing. And to share a bit, that is the reason why I joined. I never felt myself to have much faith, but I did feel the need to, to help because I knew of how many different struggles people face as it pertains to religion. And so it's been a great source of healing for myself and I've seen it have that effect on others as well. Um, RFR volunteers find meaning and purpose, and we're always in need of volunteers, all kinds of different roles. You can learn more about this at the recoveringfromreligion.com website, uh, .org, forgive me, and we'll just post this link here now, too. And I have a bit more, Eric, if you don't mind. I want to talk about all. the format of the meeting. Thank you. So we'll have a one-hour discussion with our guests. That'll be followed by a Q&A section that's 20 to 30 minutes. We ask that you type all questions into the chat during the talk. After that, we'll have the Hangout session, at which point you will be able to unmute yourself and you'll be able to ask any questions that you may have and talk among yourselves. And that's it. Awesome. Well, uh, without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce tonight's guest. Brian Fleming is a five-year volunteer slash veteran with Recovering From Religion, serving in various ways, including a helpline agent. He was the resource curator, volunteer interviewer, and an RFR support group facilitator in the Nashville, Tennessee area. Brian has volunteered for five years with Smart Recovery, also as a support group facilitator and the Tennessee regional coordinator. These volunteers role at both uh, roles at both RFR and SMART are peer support, and Brian is not a professional expert in the area. As a trained and experienced meeting facilitator, however, Brian tends to lead mock SMART recovery meetings with vigorous discussions, although without giving professional advice. Brian, welcome. It's so good to see you, my friend. How are you? Thank you, Eric, and the recovering RFRX community. How's everyone? Don't answer all at once. Okay. 
So uh, what I have in mind for, to, do I launch right into my presentation? Yes. Um, yeah. The You're here to kind of talk about um, an alternative to uh, um, Alcoholics Anonymous, right? And it's called Smart Recovery. What is it, What does SMART stand for? SMART is an acronym that stands for Self-Management and Recovery Training. Okay. I can go into that a little bit. Uh, Self-management is the idea that we are responsible for our own behaviors and uh, we are not helpless in that way. And then recovery could be from a variety of things. Alcohol and drug addiction are most common, but it also could be things like uh, gambling, smoking, overeating, and a variety of other things. And the recovery idea is that we can get better. We can get well. And then the T and the SMART is for training and tools and techniques. And that's where the evidence-based science comes in as we uh, offer people uh, ways to encounter their own recovery. And um, how, do you know how SMART kind of got started? Like where this impetus came from? It came as a um, alternative, I believe, to the prevailing methods, which is Alcoholics Anonymous and 12 Steps in such a way that it is more evidence-based, science-based, reason-based, rather than faith-based. And if you're not familiar with AA and 12 Steps, I'm not going to say anything negative about it here. It's, I've been trained not to do that, but I will point a few things out. And one thing I'll point out, it is, it is, it is faith-based and it is, um, has a religious slant to it. And you will see that uh, throughout even the, the 12 steps themselves, the, the very words. Um, that being um, the high, uh, submitting to a higher power part of um, Alcoholics Anonymous? Exactly. Okay. How long has SMART been around? Oh, I think about 30 years, I'm going to say. And oh, then wow. it's, ba it's based on um, cognitive behavior therapy, which came out in the 60s and 70s, I would say, and also rational emotive behavior therapy. So it's it's got that kind of life. Whereas the AA and the 12 steps started in the 1930s. And because it's a um, certain way of doing things, it hasn't changed in that time. And that's uh, a sign, again, that it's not really science and evidence-based, otherwise it would have progressed along with the science. One of the- Do you think um, that- oh, Sorry, Madam, oh, go sorry. ahead. Sorry. Do you think that it's the religious affiliation that that's the draw and why we know so much more about AA? AA is huge and it has helped many, many people. A lot of people have recovered from their issues with the support. Uh, of AA and 12 steps. It is enormous. And it's the biggest game in town. And but we do have a good alternative smart recovery has gained recently and has um, quite a bit of um, penetration throughout the US and other countries as well. That's great. Uh, how many people or how many um, areas uh, do you can you find smart recovery? It's most every metropolitan area. You might not be able to find it as many in the Bible Belt or in rural areas, that's for sure. But uh, most any big city will have one. Yeah, that's, the, I um, before moving here to Denver, I was in Springfield, Missouri, and that was one of the things that so many of the people there in the secular community was looking for, was a smart recovery type of system. And I had no idea how to even get something like that started and who to contact. and. Um, all that they had uh, was an Alcoholics Anonymous type of program. And, um, uh, if I was interested in setting something like that up, do you, is there a way to, to do that somehow to get to, I guess maybe we can talk about this toward the end. <laughs> sure. And um, I have in mind, you know, for today's pitch is a mock support group meeting in the smart recovery way. Uh, I've got, um, it, it provides an intro to the program, and we won't be able to have the conversation we would have in a small group, but you'll get a feel for the program by, if I step through that uh, standard agenda. Shall I do that? Yeah, yeah. If you um, feel like we've covered kind of the basics, let's go ahead and get started. All right. So imagine you've 
in COVID spent too much time at home and started drinking more than your wife wants you to, and it's time to do something about it. You might uh, Google online to find some recovery options, or, or, or maybe it's a more serious situation. Maybe you had a DUI or an overdose or something awful like that, and you Google um, secular addiction recovery because you've already um, attended maybe an a 12 step meetings and it didn't feel right to you. And so I'm going to um, share my screen here. And so you go uh, online and you find smart recovery. Another option is life ring. And another one is women of sobriety. And you think there'd be more options, but some of the ones I checked into um, their websites are, are dormant or something. And so um, these are the main ones and smart recovery certainly is the, the leader and it is the only one that I have volunteered for and am qualified to, to speak to. So you decide to go and you go to your first meeting, you walk into a room with, you know, a circle of chairs and there might be five to 15 people there. You're kind of nervous, you might be even a little embarrassed and wondering why you're there. And so you need to be kind of reassured a little bit. Uh, but now, um, these days, the meetings are all on Zoom, just like this meeting we're having here. And uh, we'll probably keep that way for a while because we even tried to have an uh, in-person meeting and a Zoom meeting combined. Nobody came. Um, everyone came in uh, on their Zoom only. So I will then uh, kick off the meeting and do an introduction followed by a brief check-in period, which I'll explain. And then we'll dive into some topics or some techniques, followed by a, uh, a wrap-up, check out, and wrap up the meeting in an hour's time. So SMART, we covered already, stands for Self-Management and Recovery Training. And we have face-to-face -face and online meetings. And there is the uh, website for www.smartrecovery.org where you can find your meetings, find resources. And uh, SMART is a nonprofit. And if you wish to volunteer, or excuse me, well, volunteer, you go there, yes. But if, if you wish to donate, um, you can go there and make your donation. I am a volunteer. This, the meetings we have are free and um, donating is certainly optional. So the final authority uh, for SMART recovery is reason and scientific knowledge. And it evolves along with the scientific knowledge. And I'll give you an example of that in a minute. Whereas a religious or a spiritual belief is not required. You may have one and you may even talk about it in the meeting and that's fine. It's just not the focus of smart recovery meetings because the smart recovery meetings emphasis is on self empowerment and improvement. So here is an example of a tool, and it is the an ABC technique, and it is a very simplified version of cognitive behavior therapy or rational behavior therapy, and it is an example of something we might walk through in in the meeting. And uh, it was a case where you would recognize that you've had an activating event, you have certain beliefs about the event. Then you have uh, some consequences as a result of those beliefs, but you can dispute those beliefs and come up with new and effective uh, beliefs instead. Now, I have accidentally jumped too far into the program, so I'm going to back up um, to some of the other introductory uh, points of smart recovery. Uh, one is it is a four point program, whereas 12 steps has how many steps? 12. <laughs> Smart recovery has only four, and that makes it more simple and simplified. Uh, first one being motivation to abstain. It has been an abstinence-based program because that is often the best way to um, totally uh, recover from an addiction like alcohol or, or drugs. But now, <clears throat> that, this is an example of where the program has changed because in recent years, we've now called it a abstinence oriented program. And that's in recognition that well, for some recoveries like from say overeating, you cannot totally abstain from that. So um, there are cases where 
moderating is what needs to be done. Although um, abstinence is the best way to go in most cases. Also, there's uh, a method called MAT, medically as assisted treatment, which in smart recovery is um, a good thing to do if it's what your doctor prescribes and is very effective and science has pro proven so. Whereas on the other hand, AA and 12 steps feel that that is just um, being on another drug and, and they don't recognize that as an effective recovery strategy in some cases. Um, so that's motivation well, to abstain. Was there a question? Yeah, one of the things that um, abstinence kind of brings to mind is uh, when it comes to uh, the, the things that I was taught growing up in, uh, in, in school from the church, like abstain from sex. And we know that that doesn't work at all. How is uh, a recovery program abstaining different than like um, abstaining when you're going through puberty or, or experiencing sex? Well, fair point. Sex is a part of life that is indispensable. Drugs and alcohol are not. Also, um, it's easier to count up to zero than it is to count drinks per week to 10 or so. Um, counting to zero is much easier. And um, um, drug courts and alcohol courts, um, sometimes people get referred to um, support groups. And those folks don't want people to keep drinking and driving, right? So mm -hmm. it is good from a legal standpoint that if you're going to count smart recovery as your support group for the week, that you did go to an abstinence-based program. And come down to it with, the, with respect to drugs and alcohol, complete stop is the most effective way to overcome it. Oh, wow. I, uh, I had no idea. That's okay. Um, I didn't get quite get your down your count to zero metaphor. Um, I, well, I don't, some I don't understand that moderation fully. programs uh, have you counting the number of drinks that you have in a week. And so you, you might say, okay, I'm going to moderate and I'm only going to have seven drinks per week, one a day, say. Mm. Well, it's easy to lose count. What did I have one or two? I don't know. But if you're counting to zero, it's easy. Got it. Got it. Well, thank you for that clarification. All right. So we're walking through the four points of the program. We covered abstinence. The next is coping with urges and learning how to overcome when an urge happens. Now, <clears throat> we also sometimes have, say, an urge to answer or check your phone for a text, right? But you can overcome the urge just sometimes by waiting it out. They don't last as long as people sometimes feel they will. And also, it might be just a matter of regulating your cravings. So program point number two is coping with urges. Number three is thoughts, feelings, and behaviors and problem solving on those dimensions. And that's where we get into the rational emotive behavior therapy techniques. And um, it is where the evidence-based methods kick in at that point. And then last point is lifestyle balance. And that is as you reduce or eliminate the problem, problematic uh, behavior, what do you replace it with? And hopefully it's with something that gives you some meaning in life, some satisfaction, some fun, and some um, positive results that maybe uh, drugs and alcohol do not. Because if you do a checklist, you'll find that drugs and alcohol's benefits are all pretty much short term. You get that buzz, but then it goes away and next morning, not so great, right? And abstaining has benefits that tend to be longer term and you reap those rewards um, in, in a long term or over a lifetime, right? So uh, accomplishing a lifestyle balance and finding direction and meaning is what we replace the need for drugs and alcohol in many cases. And also one of the um, keys there is, is uh, connection with other people. Some people say the opposite of ab you know, abstinence is, is our, or engaging is actually um, connection with other people is the best thing that everyone needs, right? 
Okay, so a few other points. Um, if I was doing an intro to a meeting, because I am attempting to do a mock smart recovery meeting, mm -hmm. and I'm going on just a little bit for an intro, but that's okay. Um, is it is a um, confidential meeting? Everyone is um, um, what you say here stays here, but we do encourage crosstalk. Now, in some um, groups like AA and Twelve Steps, crosstalk is discouraged, and I, it may be because they're Meetings sometimes are so big that there's no time for it. But in smart recovery, we are there to support one another. And so talking to one another about these issues is very much welcome. Your level of- when you say, Sorry, when you say crosstalk, is that continuing a conversation or what, what does that mean? That means that you might ask another participant a question or give another uh, participant a suggestion you're allowing people in the room to talk to one another. It's not just the speaker to the people. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. So with that, um, I would have accomplished pretty much the intro to what smart recovery is all about. And then I would turn the meeting over into a check-in. And then a check-in is where each participant will say why they're here and what they're trying to get out of the meeting and what they hope to accomplish. Now, that is something different than um, an AA meeting where you may have heard of someone standing up and saying, my name's Brian and I'm an alcoholic. And then they proceed to tell you their entire history with their drug of choice. It's sometimes called a drunk -a -log. And that's not what we're interested in at Smart Recovery because we want to talk about, well, maybe how are you doing this week, today? and where are you going in the near future? So I, we won't do a check-in here because we have 75 participants, but if we <laughs> did, it would be a, a fairly brief um, check-in for each person. And then in the check-in, you would um, hopefully discover something to talk about in more depth and to use a tool on. Well, why don't you um, use uh, Medlin and I as the guinea pigs or uh, as a stand-in for the participants here? So how would I, how would I check in? So give me a, a brief uh, indication of how you're doing now, why you're here, and what you hope to get out of the meeting. Oh, I see. Okay. I am uh, I'm doing good. Um, the, so I'm doing good. The next thing was like, why am I here? Mm -hmm. um, I'm here because... Um, I've done cocaine three times last week and I want to stop. I haven't really done cocaine three times. What like. we say here is confidential, everyone. <laughs> this is going on YouTube. <laughs> 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 oh gosh. Uh, I've done the drugs uh, a few times last week and um, I want to stop doing the drugs. Very good. Is that, is that... That's fine. Madeline, would you like to check in? Uh, yes. Hi, my name is Madeline. I'm here for support. I'm dealing with grief after the death of my father and grandfather, and uh, the drinking is out of control. Not true. Put in YouTube. But... All right. So um, I hear then that you've had a um, uh, activating event, and there is a tool called the ABCs, which I already introduced, but maybe now I can um, go back to those and say, um, you've had an activating event, uh, a death in the family. And uh, that's caused some um, trauma for you. And for, then you have a belief about that event. And the belief could be maybe that drinking will help you overcome that trauma. Is that, is that why you've been drinking? Yes just to numb it all. To numb the pain, absolutely. And, and there are, you know, payoffs to um, um, drinking and, and drugs that, and there's reasons why we do them, right? Um, so you, you've had though some consequences, you've been unhappy with the amount that you're drinking and you find yourself now at a support group meeting talking about it, right? Have, have there been any other consequences you're not comfortable with? I'm not spending enough time with my family and I'm feeling guilty about that. Right. That's understandable. 
So, so when you say activating event, that's to me sounds like you're saying this triggered you, like a modern day cool word to say triggering. Yeah, it, it starts with A, so it's a great, great T wouldn't be out, in the, <laughs> out of the alphabet. We'd have to go way down the list. That's right. Maybe you can have like a TLC instead of an ABC or something like that. But uh, so at this point, uh, though, you know, I've, I've asked you about um, using drugs to numb, and then you would dispute that idea by questioning it. And, and so um, what might be wrong with the idea, I guess, of using drugs and alcohol in that occasion? Just all the negative consequences from it. Right. So you might then dispute and question your beliefs. And, and then what the, you're looking for at this point is an effective new belief to replace that with. So what is a more effective way to look at the, the sadness of the acting event and how to overcome it? Uh, I can up my meditation practice and do more self healing activities, walking, running, etc. Exactly. Exactly. And um, another one that I would always uh, ask you to think of is that thing called connection. So you might uh, want to connect with other people in your life, um, discuss the circumstance and get some comfort from one another, rather than possibly isolating with the drugs and alcohol. So that would be replacing it with a new and more effective belief. <clears throat> now, another thing I did there with you is I got you to start talking about better ways of thinking and better choices to where I might also ask you, um, what are the chances that you'll succeed? And why didn't you um, recommend something else. So I, I can get you to start b uh, backing up your own ideas of better effective beliefs. And that's a technique called motivational interviewing, which was uh, um, part of the training for, I, I didn't mention this point, is that uh, to be a facilitator, we have a six week training program online and it has a lot of wonderful life tools in addition to how to run a meeting but also learning things like motivational interviewing, cognitive behavior therapy, and so on. Now you do not come out as a counselor and I'm, I need to remind that I'm not a counselor and, and a therapist of any type. All I can do though is facilitate a meeting. And uh, I've been trained to do that. So, uh, and it is peer support. Um, but anyway, um, Smart Recovery does have a training program for facilitators, and that is something that is missing from the AA and 12-step method. All right, so now we've done an example of working through a tool. And by the way, we have a handbook, a Smart Recovery handbook with- uh, How thick is it? $12. Show us the side. Oh, okay. And it's got uh, all kinds of tools like those, which the participant can use and um, find tools and techniques. So it is an educational, um, program we're working on. And I mentioned while, we're, while I'm showing my books, this is my facilitator training manual. Okay. With um, all, all the tips of how to run a better meeting and how to use some of these tools. And so, Brian, um, a quick question. Sorry. What if I'm one you're having this uh, going through the worksheet with doesn't quite have an effective new belief like is that something that can is it a process you know like how is it like AA you continue to go you can try these tools you can have them fit the situation and they may not exactly fit um, but we just do our best as support group people helping one another with these ideas and as you do this you might do it in a meeting with other participants there who will chip in and say, what do you? What about um, um, trying exercising, as you mentioned? Um, so you get the group uh, discussion going as well. <clears throat> now, one thing I um, was asked to do when I was originally invited to do this talk was to compare Smart Recovery to AA and Twelve Steps, and I've been doing some of that along the way. Um, but I've got. Um, 
some things in mind that I'd like to share with you now about that. And recognizing again, I have to remind myself, I am not here to trash AA or uh, Narcotics Anonymous or 12 Steps at all, but to explain the differences and allow you to make the best choices. Because there are many paths to recovery and you might come to a smart recovery meeting once a week, but you might need to go to meetings more often and you might want to go to an AA meeting on the other nights. And we totally encourage that. Oh, I never even thought about that, combining yeah, the that's two right. programs. You combine together. methods. Now, if you say that in AA that you want to go to some other types of meetings, they're probably going to say, you know, our way is the, the best way and you need to make sure you do it our way. Um, but smart recovery is more open to the idea that there are many paths to recovery that different people may wish to choose. <clears throat> so when we think about, and that's another example, when we think about AA a and 12 steps, here are the 12 steps. <clears throat> and I don't know if you've ever seen them before laid out, <clears throat> but you can see um, quite often there is a high, there's a power with a capital P, there's a God with a capital G, there's another God, another God, there's a hymn with a capital H. So God is throughout the 12 steps. And the very first one, um, the very first of the 12 steps is probably the most troublesome one. And it doesn't really involve God, but it says, we admit we, were pow we are powerless over alcohol. Now that is 180 degrees different from what we're talking about in smart recovery, where we say we're self-management, we're, we're required for our own recovery, we are responsible, and we are empowered. So it is, uh, we're talking about two entirely uh, different programs. Yeah, I'm seeing praying in here. It, it feels like, just reading through these things, it feels like I'm setting myself to be a victim and powerless. Whereas if, like, on the other hand, it sounds like from what you've described out smart, you're giving me the control back the, to change um, my behavior. Right, the control and the tools, yes. And the, and the sport. Now, here's a case where they are in common. AA and 12 Steps and Smart Recovery are both support groups. And people, the benefit that people get from it is that support quite often is the main thing, right? So that we have in common, support. But there are then many other uh, differences. And I'm going to take this uh, slide down because I have one more, and it's a list of the of the differences. Actually, the slides are a uh, that I showed were, are kind of an example of a whiteboard that I might have in the meeting because I might write SMART and the acronym and what it means, and I, I always wrote down the four program points on the whiteboard. So that was my whiteboard. <clears throat> so. Uh, if it's okay, I would like to just run down a checklist of comparisons between AA and Smart Recovery. Good time yeah, for that? It sounds great. All right. So first one is that AA has 12 steps, Smart Recover only four. So um, it is a much simpler program and you can actually remember those four, whereas the 12 steps you might forget after step three, right? Uh, AA is faith-based and SMART ev is evidence-based. And um, one way you know that uh, it is AA is faith-based is that it has not changed since the 1930s because they have faith in that method. And um, folks that are church-going and faith people might feel very comfortable there, but people who are secular, like many of us in this meeting, uh, might feel quite uncomfortable there. And so they need to find something that fits their needs. <clears throat> but then evidence-based is what we're trying to do at Smart Recovery. And that's tricky in the social sciences, right? To really nail something down as evidence-based. So let me give you some examples. I know a um, um, uh, practice of therapy that is based on Enneagrams. Is Enneagrams a evidence-based method? I don't even know what Enneagram is. Okay. It's the first time I've heard that word. Okay. Is this like a, uh, just a random word you came up with? <laughs> no, it's a, it's a popular um, personality type um, method. Uh, well, the, the hint is it is not evidence-based. It is pretty much a horoscope. 
Is that like but the, people I'm use like it? An, uh, people, uh, there's a practice in therapy that I'm familiar with that uses it as their main mode of, of therapy. So it is not evidence based. Another is one the, is like Myers, when I'm, another example is Myers Briggs. Um, if you're familiar with that, the INTJ and the ISTP and those things. Yeah, I'm more familiar with that. Okay. Yeah. Also not evidence based in, yeah. in my opinion, but it's, it's not been uh, proven out that those are really effective ways to type personalities. So it's hard to pin down what actually is evidence based. And Daryl and I have had lots of conversations about this when we were deciding what things to put in our resources. And uh, because we only wanted to put things that are evidence based in there and not lead people astray with uh, with spirituality and mushrooms and um, other things that uh, are not evidence based uh, approaches. Uh, here's another example, equine therapy for children, ba uh, evidence based. Um, yes, let's say yes, maybe, maybe, but I don't think so. Okay, it could be. All right, so uh, evidence base is important. Um, the another one, as I mentioned earlier, is powerlessness in the AA and the 12 steps and empowering in the smart. Uh, I mentioned the drunkalog, his long history, and the brief check in forward look at, looking at smart. And then labels at a smart, or excuse me, at an AA or a 12 steps meeting, people say, I'm Brian and I'm an addict, and I'm going to be an addict my whole life. And I've got to do the work and keep coming to these meetings my whole life. Do the work. Sound a little religious, right? But um, in smart recovery, we do not label ourselves. We would say, I'm a man, I'm a father, I'm an employee, I'm a brother who has a problem I'm working on, substance abuse, and I'm going to try to overcome it. It's a different way of looking at it and we don't call ourselves labels. Also, we can recover and not need to attend meetings anymore. Whereas AA and 12 steps say you need to pretty much come the rest of your life because you will always be an alcoholic. In smart recovery, you can recover, you can graduate effectively and move on with your life without, uh, go to the meetings as long as they're helpful, as long as you need to. All right. Um, another thing that is in common, as I mentioned before, is peer support in both cases. In um, AA has recovered group leaders, people who are in recovery themselves are the group leaders. That's also true in smart recovery, except we've been trained and we've been given tools and methods to lead an effective meeting and, and use those tools. And there's three kinds of people pretty much that are smart recovery facilitators. One is people that are in recovery themselves. Two is professional people that um, use the methods and also want to help in, in that way in a volunteer setting. And the third, in, the, in my case, is just people who see a need and want to help. And um, so those are the main three kinds of people that become facilitators. And you can sign up to become a facilitator by going to the website and um, entering into the training program. All right, uh, the next uh, difference or actually a, a similarity is they're both abstinence-based. AA and smart recovery are abstinence-based. Um, smart recovery is recognizing though that there are some addictions and behaviors that you cannot um, completely abstain from. Overeating is one. And then also um, smart recovery is open to medically assisted tr uh, treatment which would be like Suboxane and things that uh, help people overcome opioids and whatnot that have been prescribed by a doctor and shown to be effective by science. SMART supports those. Usually AA and 12 steps uh, do not because they see it as just another drug. Uh, another one is the disease model. In AA and 12 steps, they teach that it is a disease and that is how it is. And if you think differently, you're just wrong. At Smart Recovery, um, it's okay if you think it's a disease, that's fine, we can work with that. It's okay if you think it's not really a disease, it's more behavior, we can help you with that. Uh, we're here to help you no matter what you believe about that particular topic. Um, but people and experts have had 
long, long debates about whether alcoholism is a disease. And go ahead and have that debate if you want. But here at SMART, we will help whether it's true or not. Oh, right. that's, that's fantastic. It's not like you're trying, you're fighting on one <clears throat> side of the coin or the other like yes atheist or yes uh alcoholism is an addiction or no it's not an addiction you're just like we don't really care we're gonna help you one way or one, one way or another that's right that's pretty cool so now there's a tricky topic that some folks that are recovering from religion are familiar with and that is uh sex addiction and you you might say well there is no such thing as sex addiction or there is no disease called sex addic addiction and that may be so, but at Smart Recovery, if you come in wanting to reduce the amount of time you look at porn and you want to stop doing it in front of your wife, then we're going to talk through that and help you accomplish the goals and improve your circumstances, whether or not it's an, uh, an addiction or a disease. Oh, so, oh my gosh. So you guys are really coming at this just from accountability. Like I can come to a meeting for almost anything that I want to be held accountable for, whether it's drugs, alcohol, I mean, sex addiction, maybe social media or something yeah, like that yeah. too. Social media, computers, gambling. I uh, have many uh, uh, gamblers come in. Sure. Oh, wow. So this is an accountability system that is set up for just about anything. And it seems really flexible and not just focused on one individual uh, type of addiction. Uh, that's right. In some um, AA, you know, you have Alcoholics Anonymous and you have Narcotics Anonymous, and you pretty much need to be one or the other to go to their meetings. And if you start talking about um, using cocaine at an alco alcoholics meeting, you're a little bit out of place. But um, any of those issues are welcome at Smart Recovery. Got it. All right. Um, another difference is AA has a thing called a sponsor, which is someone who kind of guides you through and calls you if you miss a meeting and, and, and checks in on you. And um, because SMART is self-managed, we don't have those. And we're figuring you're adults and you don't need to be checked on like your children. All right. And then another I've, one that I just learned about um, in preparing for this speech is there's a thing in AA called singleness of purpose. Can we go back to the um, oh, sure. Uh, uh, sure. The sponsor one real quick? Mm -hmm. I, I've seen that the sponsor model can really be taken advantage of by some uncouth people like they um, they can take control of some people in, in a sense, but these sponsors can, is that, have you heard of yeah. something? Yeah, that's a risk. But actually when I was describing that, I think I came down a little too hard on the sponsor because that helps a lot of people. And mm -hmm. it is um, also a, a social bond interaction. They become, they can become friends. So there's connection. Okay. So there's probably many good things to sponsor. It's just not part of the self, uh, the smart program. So that may be one reason why someone would want to attend or participate in both programs. Uh, exactly. Okay. You, you pull what works from each. Yes. Man, this is super empowering. <laughs> this is way better than I thought it would be. All right. Now, <laughs> for AA, they have a, a new, th well, this is new to me. I learned it as I prepared for this presentation. They have a thing called singleness of purpose. And that is that and everything that's said in an AA meeting needs to be about addiction and about uh, stopping alcohol. Um, but there really is a whole life that people have where there, as I mentioned before, were fathers, brothers, employees, uncles, wives, sisters, you know, we have complete lives and being um, a person who has a problem with a substance, that's just a part of it. And the other things may be a cause. For instance, Madeline's example was a death in the family was a trigger. So some trauma or something going on might be what's really behind the, the, the use. So having a singleness of purpose would, I think, 
cause you to miss out on many of the dimensions that people have that might affect their, their situation. Um, on the other hand, smart recovery has one of the pro four program points is lifestyle balance. And that is making sure that you've got, you know, that you're not spending 12 hours a day on your phone, but you're actually going outside and you're uh, going to work and you're writing a book and you're learning to play guitar and you're doing things with friends. And so you have a balanced life and you're not um, overdoing it in one certain area. Um, and that there are many paths to recovery is another example, because in singleness of purpose, they would say our way is the only way it's a single way. Mm. And um, smart recovery is about the many. I like that. That all right, more questions. That's awesome. Uh, do we have questions? Um, uh, can we kind of back up to the beginning? Like, Brian, you had um, mentioned that you've been a uh, smart group facilitator or meeting facilitator for five years. What what got you into this? Now, there's a good question because I am not in recovery myself. But uh, uh, I had a son who needed some recovery treatment and we found the, the nearest rehab. Oh, I, rehab. That's a topic I haven't hit yet. Everything I'm talking about here is support groups, okay? I'm not really talking about rehab and facilities and medical treatment like that. Um, but um, my son and, and many people uh, need some rehab. And if you go try to find some, almost all of it is based on AA and 12 steps. And after 28 days of that, it didn't feel right for him, didn't feel right for me. So I started to look around for other options and I discovered smart recovery. And then along came a... Um, Humanist magazine in June of 2015, and it said smart recovery. And I read all about it, and it said if you want to start a meeting, sign up here. And I did, and I I noticed there were not any smart recovery meetings in Middle Tennessee, and I thought there should be because people need a choice, they need options, you know, especially yeah. if it's court ordered. If the court orders you to to AA 12 steps, they're telling you to go partake in a religion. And they, you need a secular option so that it is separation of church and state, right? Yeah. All right. So uh, I went and started a group uh, first in Murfreesboro and then got other facilitators involved and we're running it now in Nashville and other people are taking, taking it away and I'm uh, in semi-retirement. <laughs> <laughs> so that's yeah. how I got into it. I love it. That's pretty cool. Um, uh, kind of going back to the faith-based versus evidence-based, um, we've kind of talked about the faith, we had the faith discussion a little bit here on RFRX, but it seems that evidence-based is so much more flexible and can, can adapt to our own understanding where as opposed to um, faith-based, which just seems to be like wishful thinking, like, hey, this is how I think it should work. And uh, I have faith. And so we don't need to change it at all. Um, and from what how you've described SMART, it has actually changed um, over the 30 years in, the, uh, in, in its life. Is, would, would that be accurate way to describe it? That's right. The example, a good example of that was the addition of MAT, medically ass assisted treatment. I was a little concerned about SMART still stuck in the 60s with cognitive behavior therapy and rational emotive behavior therapy um, and wondered why it isn't like moving on past that, maybe considering feelings and so on. But if I learned a couple reasons. One is we got to keep it simple because we're just peer support. We're not therapists and experts. So all we can do is like ABC checklist. We can't go into um, all the detail that a, an expert could. So mm -hmm. that's one thing, it's gotta be simple and it's gotta be fairly um, proven out um, before we can take on new and exciting um, modalities of, of I, I shouldn't call it treatment, but modalities of support. That's, that's an excellent way to put it. I wanted to comment on how wonderful it is, how all inclusive it is. I do. 
in my family, I, there is alcoholism. There's a cousin that is religious, and she's taken, she visited, and I took her to a number of different AA meetings. And I like the cognitive part of it, you know, how they have you focus on one thing at a time, and it's very practical. But I had my cousin coach me because as an atheist myself, I I don't have a higher power. I, and then she was almost coaching me to maybe I could say I myself would be that or or science is my higher power. Just like throwing all these things that might hit, but it's almost like a self pitch, you know. And right. not every meeting up you, plays up the uh, the religious part. I noticed that also that it just varies by group. It does. So when there's talk of a higher power, that's a substitute word for God, but they really do mean God, because if they say to you, okay, your, your higher power can be a tree. Well, how in the hell is a tree going to help you with an addiction problem, right? But they're saying that this higher power is going to fix you. So that tree is not going to do it. So they're not talking about a tree. They're talking about a, a God that uh, interacts with you right yeah someone they they want you to have that that faith you know to direct mm -hmm. it at something that's always him capital h i mm -hmm. follow yeah one of the um criticisms i've seen of alcoholics anonymous is that they haven't been tracking recidivism like the number of people who enter the program then leave the program and then fall back into their old um addictions or habits um, and uh, it's see, evidence is kind of coming out that it's pretty high. Recidivism from AA is pretty high. Um, does SMART have any sort of um, way to, to track that, uh, track their effectiveness? Uh, I think is really, uh, how does SMART track their effectiveness when it comes to folks attending the meetings? Very good question. And we don't have a good way to do it either. What we do have, though, is our methods are based on things like cognitive behavior therapy and other, other approaches that have science-based evidence from labs and from studies. And so it's not that our, pro, um, our smart recovery program is itself evidence-based. It is based on evidence-based techniques, if I could put it that way. Got it. Yes. Some of these things, you know, are very hard to, to nail down. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, we've got quite a few questions, quite a few questions. Um, before we hop into those, uh, Brian, do you have anything else you kind of want to um, cover? Well, I think it's probably a good time for a little wrap up idea that I have and a, a case to give you a little bit of the world according to Brian. All right. All right. Let's do that. So one of the features of AA and 12 stacks that I love is a thing called the serenity prayer. You're familiar with the serenity prayer, right? Yes. Um, here is the list of the compare and contract. And now, now at the bottom, we have the serenity prayer. So it is, you know, God grant me the serenity to accept. This is a wall or a refrigerator magnet. Uh, God grant me the the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Very popular. Um, one reason it's popular is because it goes on at all the AA 12 steps meetings, and it's on lots of people's refrigerators. I like the fact that this refrigerator magnet removes the God. It just uh, it starts with grant me. That's cool, but that still doesn't do it. Because what is still wrong with this statement? Grant me these things. You're still talking about a, a higher power, something out of our control. Yeah. You're yeah, asking from some, someone else. Yeah. These things down here are not granted to people. They're things that you develop through mm. study and, and practice and um, contemplation. So I've written a Brian's version of the serenity prayer. Here is Brian's serenity prayer develop the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to oh, know the Oh, I like that. You got to work at it. Um, it doesn't come easy. It. It, and it can, 
you get better at it, um, but it doesn't come, it's not granted to you. If you want to read the full write up on that, you can go to my blog at bajanbo.blogspot.com there. Uh, I don't have that link to share. So we'll, we'll get that in a bit uh, right. to you. But yeah, this, this again, um, the Brian's Serenity Prayer, which I'm sure that's what it's called in the training manual, right, Brian? This seems to give me the power to control this unless like uh, I am, uh, like the Serenity Prayer almost seems like I'm taking a chance and I don't have control um, maybe I won't get granted it. Maybe I will. Maybe the person who's granting it is having a bad day and uh, says, fuck you, Eric. Um, but the way that you've written it, I have the power to do this. I can work on this. I, I can get the, the uh, get this done. Oh, the right. link's at the bottom. <laughs> okay. Now you've got the world according to Brian. And I, I will it. stop my share. So uh, what's, is there, uh, we did the check-in, is there kind of like a wrap-up type of thing that we do at the end of the meeting? Oh, at the mock smart recovery meeting that I forgot I'm running. Yeah. <laughs> um, after we work through uh, some individual problems that people are having and using a, a technique, by then the, the, the hour is gone because the time flies. And so there's a checkout where people will tell the, the group, what they thought of the meeting, what they got out of it. And we always get these glowing thank yous for how great the fee, the mood of the, me the meeting is. It's, it's just got a good vibe going on. And, and some of them are pretty unhappy with um, other meetings they've gone to, not to name them. And they come with some relief and, and, then, they and then they start making friends and making connections at our meetings too. So we get all those comments. That was one of the questions that we had. Um, AA, someone mentioned that AA has a big book and it's filled with stories of people who have come through AA um, successfully. Uh, it's filled with successful um, stories. Does uh, SMART have something similar to that? Is that kind of what we were just talking about? That those were comments from people at the end of meetings, but I don't okay. know of a big book like that. Uh, we do have a website and it's a wonderful website where all our tools and things are. And the beauty of that is we can improve it. Right. Yeah. Always add to it. That's for sure. Right. Brian, this was amazing. Um, I, we've got, like I said, we've got quite a few questions. Um, Madeline, do you want to take one of them and go ahead and uh, start us off with that? Yeah, I'll be glad to. The very first one we got was about, I guess, another recovery program called SOS. I'm not familiar with it, but the question was about whether it's still around or not. Good question, because when I went looking for it, it um, their website had expired. So I'm not sure. Got it. Thank you. Um, we had another question here. Um, we uh, At the very beginning, we talked about like counting to zero and uh, abstaining. Um, and one of the person's concern, which I think is pretty valid, um, if we suddenly, if we were like a heavy alcoholic and drinking quite a bit and we suddenly stop drinking, um, isn't that, can that be dangerous? Can we experience some physiological uh, effects from that? Yes. And that is a medical situation. And we are a support group of peers and so hopefully that has already happened. Um, and if not, then we need to get people where they need to be. And it's possibly not at a support group meeting with us because we're just, it's just us kids, you know? Yeah, I got it. That makes sense. Yeah. I'll take the next one. It's, is there a making amends step in SMART as there is in AA? There is, uh, again, this is one of those things that I like about AA, and that's my favorite of the 12 steps, making amends. And I would say it's not specifically called out, but it is built into the idea of um, connection and maintaining uh, relationships. So I would put it into the category four of lifestyle balance, and then also in the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Um, 
you're having some thoughts and feelings that have affected your behaviors and you might be apologetic and want to apologize to some people as a result. Excellent. It's, it makes sense. Thank you. Uh, um, I, or can smart programs be found in uh, prisons? Is that something that here in America that, uh, or elsewhere in the world? Yes, um, they have been going on in prisons. It was one of those things where I wondered if I had the, if I had what it takes to go do that. And I decided that would be one step in too deep for me. But yes, we do have uh, smart programs in prisons. Are they kind of run exactly the same in prison as they are outside? Similar, yes. Do you know about how many people are referred to secular programs versus AA by court? What we hope for in the court situation is to get on their list. In other words, I went to the uh, Rutherford County, which is Gail knows is where Murfreesboro is, and to their drug and alcohol court. And I said, I don't really need you to refer people to my program. I just want to be on the list so that when you show them the list, I'm one of the choices. You, yeah, so that's an option. That's great. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, so we got a question from someone over on Discord, and uh, they're saying that in AA, they don't feel comfortable coming out as an atheist, like as a non believer. Um, what is that like? What would be the experience like of an atheist or, or a non believer in a smart uh, support meeting? Atheists are quite comfortable at smart meetings and they quite often come out and, and, and say it there because they know they're among other secular people anyway, but um, not all by any stretch are atheists. And so um, we're just open to any um, background. I would but imagine. I, I can imagine why at the AA meeting, it would be hard because then some people would be telling you, okay, well, your higher power is the sky. And then you get into these d awkward situations, I would say. Got it. Yeah. Okay. I, I can see that. Got it. Um, one of the, the questions is like, where do these training manuals and this booklet come like come from? Like who makes them? Is it just some Joe Blow or or how do they come into existence? You go to the website, www.smartrecovery.org. And they're all there. Right. Who makes them? I don't know. It's contracted out. Okay. So uh, oh, do not... you mean, do you mean who writes them? Yes. The, the yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Not who publishes them. Like yeah, I, where, I, how sorry. is this content made? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's um, written by and authorized by smart recovery. Or it's it's adopted from something that fits with us, and but then there's a review board, to, uh, dis decision making body that decides what can actually be put into the workbook, for instance. Okay, but can those names kind of be found on the website? Like, hey, I'm on the these these people are on the review board. Uh, well, the leadership of Smart is there. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, because um, one, one of the, the person who asked this question was like, this seems kind of all like just seat of the pants and, uh, and, and made up, but it's nice to hear that um, there's a review board that uh, this has to all kind of go through. And they're actually a little bit cautious and conservative about adding new methods. Um, so they're very careful to make sure that it is proven out and, and that it aligns with everything else we do. Yeah. We have a couple of questions here about the facilitator, facilitator training. One is whether it's self-guided and the other one is, does Smart lend assistance with starting a meeting after the facilitator training? Okay, the facilitator training is online. It is self-paced and it takes six weeks. The first four being kind of instructional and workbook on how to run a meeting but also how to get a meeting going and market it 
and then also uh, tools to use to help people. And then the last two weeks are uh, watching a, a meeting and process that's done online. And then um, the top leader generally talks to the new group of facilitators for, in the last meeting to kind of set the direction. It is self-paced. Awesome, thank you. So it does sound like um, the new facilitators do have some hands-on guidance before uh, doing their first, sitting down for their first meeting. Yes, then we have uh, regional coordinators. For instance, I was that for Tennessee and we help new facilitators come along. And I remember when I was new, I had the circumstance that's not unusual where you go and have your meeting and no one comes. <laughs> so you're sitting there thinking, well, what am I doing here, right? Um, and then you have to start thinking strategies to um, get the word out. And what did it for me was that uh, getting on that Rutherford County DUI court list, and then people started to trickle in from there. Now, you might think, oh, those are just people that have to go. But once you get them there, um, they're good people, too. And you wind up helping them anyway, um, even if they weren't sure they wanted to be there at first. And one thing that's always surprising to me, and maybe it shouldn't be, is that uh, drug users and, and, and drinkers are wonderfully nice people with, you know, they're funny and they're, you know, nice to be around and they're trying their best and the, they, they didn't quite make it, but they're, they're good folks, you know? So the takeaway here is if you want to be a nice person, do drugs and alcohol and go to smart meetings. That, that's right. All right. <laughs> no, don't, that's not the good advice. So are the facilitators monitored? Um, can they can they go rogue if if or go sour or something like that? And how, how is that checked? There could be um, people could contact the headquarters if a facilitator is out of line and it's a challenge uh, in any organization that is disparate or what, what do you call when they're located in many places like just recovery yeah. from religion. Yeah. <laughs> Spread um, but, out. But you know, there are ways that we could learn from each other as far as the support groups at RFR mm -hmm. and the support groups at smart recovery. Um, because I'm both, I, I use the tools I learned in one and the other, and then I take the tools I learned in one and the other. And I, the good the news is when I make it through a meeting without using the wrong word and calling it smart to RFR or RFR to smart. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, um, the way you're kind of uh, you work through this meeting, I have um, seen quite a few similarities between an RFR support group meeting and the meeting you described, uh, the smart meeting you've described as well. I'll tell you um, one difference. Yeah. There's always way more people at Smart Recovery. Um, there's a bigger business in addiction recovery than there is religion recovery. Go figure. I don't know why, but that seems to be the case. Um, let's see here. Uh, how, how many people in Smart do you think are actually getting professional help? Many are. I'll say most seem to be going to counselors as well. Therapists, yes. Got it. Uh, one of the, um, during the meeting, if, if you kind of sense that someone has uh, an alcohol problem or a drug problem and um, they're encouraged to abstain from uh, the substance of choice, um, are, is there any medical advice that's given by the facilitators or? Um... Not medical advice, but just reminders that um, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a therapist. You need to get that direction from professionals and I'm not one. So you as a facilitator would encourage the person to go talk to um, a professional medical doctor um, uh, just to, to manage the symptoms and things like that. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, uh, Medlin, do you have any other questions that you'd like to bring up? No, I think we had, we covered a great range of questions and it was a yeah, wonderful really presentation, did. Brian. And thanks so much. Oh, I got one last question. Uh, is that okay, Medlin? 
No yeah, more please questions. go ahead. <laughs> no, go ahead. If I wanted to set up a smart recovery uh, support group in my area, how would I do that? You start by contacting the website, getting your training, and then you will get advice on how to do it in the training and it's in the manual. But things like you have to find a space and the space, you know, kind of like a RFR meeting needs to be probably not a church, right? Mm -hmm. And, but it can be, but it's best if it's, you know, and so you need a quiet place. It needs to be private. It needs to be hopefully free because um, there's no money um, coming in other than donations, right? right. So, um, and it needs to be safe and comfortable for welcoming for people, right? Um, so you have to get set up just like um, an RFR support group meeting. Got it. So it sounds like most of these meetings are held in maybe libraries or um, coffee houses or uh, maybe like some social group building or something like that too. Yes. In my case, the meetings at Murfreesboro and then at Nashville were in um, recovery facilities that were open to having something in their um, building that wasn't AA and 12 steps. Perfect. Which is sometimes hard to find. Ryan, um, thank you so much, so, so much for coming and talking to us about this. This has been incredibly helpful. And actually, I am uh, feeling really um, positive about this going forward. Like, I knew that AA was um, such a big, big thing out there for addiction recovery. And I had uh, no idea how much uh, SMART um, does in, the, in, in all, all over the, the nation and uh, probably all over the world too. So this sounds really, really good. And I love kind of how you just said, hey, if you want to do both of them, do both of them too. You'll get benefits, take from one what you want and take from the other what you want. So it's just been a fantastic talk. Thank you so much, Brian. You're welcome. Thanks for having me, everyone. Uh, we've got a bunch of resources that he's provided for us. I'm gonna go ahead and copy that and I'll drop it into the chat for both uh, here and in Discord as well. Hey, Discord folks. Um, coming up next week, we have David Fitzgerald, and he is talking about is the founder of your religion imaginary. So this is going to be an interesting discussion. I'm kind of looking forward to it. David Fitzgerald is a fantastic uh, speaker as well. I also want to let you know that um, all of our previous RFRX recordings can be found on our YouTube channel. If you've got any topic suggestions, questions, or comments, please email us at rfrx at recoveringfromreligion.org. Take a look at our blog. Take a look at our podcast. Folks, um, uh, you know, we've, we talk a lot about volunteering. We talk a lot about uh, donating. Um, but there is actually another way that you can help RFR out. Um, you can, uh, what's that? Uh, you can follow us on all of our social media. Uh, not participate. Engage. The word is engage, just like Captain Picard. You can engage with us on social media. We, we're all over the place. We are on uh, Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, and of course, uh, YouTube. So please head on over to some of those places, uh, like, follow, engage, share. That would, that, you have no idea how much that helps us out. So if you've got the time, um, please uh, do so. Uh, now, before we close, I think we have a fantastic message and closing thoughts by our uh, executive director, Gail Jordan. Gail, how are you doing today? I'm fine. Thank you, Eric. Thank you so much, Brian, for an unbelievable presentation. I, I started taking notes and then I just gave up. I was going to try to think of a couple of things, but everything that you have said about everything that smart recovery is up to and including your own personal prayer, <laughs> your, um, I don't, you didn't refer to it as a prayer, but it, it made everything when you bring in logic and reason and you and you can discard superstition and beliefs without evidence, you open, as Daryl said in the chat, as Dr. Ray mentioned in the chat, you open up such a universe of possibilities when we 
when we discard that and we open it, open it up to, to reason and ration. I was so encouraged. First of all, I didn't know all of this. And so this has been a very informative meeting, but I was so encouraged. I can't imagine how defeating it is for a person who's struggling and the thinking, the whole AA thinking is, you know, you've got this the rest of your life. And so this is what you're going to have to do. And you're going to have to do these meetings and every, if you can never take another drink. And if you do take a drink, you're going to fall off the cliff and it's going to be a thing. And I was so encouraged by the fact that maybe and sometimes, and maybe not sometimes as, as Medellin's example was, there may be, what's the word? It's not trigger activating, activating event that sets you off that those, those circumstances may come and go. And so maybe you're, you're not faced with that for all time. Maybe it was situational. And so anyway, I think I'm rambling, but it's because I was so overwhelmed and um, impressed by the presentation. So thank you for sharing it with us. To those of you who've been in attendance with us, thank you for coming. Um, there, have, there are folks that come every week and you just take whatever subject you can get. And then there are folks that come because of the subject matter. And those folks that are visiting with us tonight, uh, thank you for coming, whatever your circumstances are. Thank you for participating and for um, hearing everything that Brian had to present and uh, how important the secular side of things are. We are so saturated with religious imagery and religious language. And um, when we hear about something like this, and we see how much more is open to us, how big, how much bigger life can be when we're not restricted by the bounds of superstition and belief without evidence. It's, um, it's encouraging and it's inspiring. So thank you all for coming, Brian. Thank you for your presentation. Please everybody hang out in the session. That's the best part of the whole evening. Sometimes we go for a long, long time. If you didn't get your question answered, that's a time for you to do that. So thank you again for joining and we'll see you all next week. Thank you.